This is going to be completely made up as I go along because I had a PowerPoint presentation. I hate PowerPoint, but I had this wonderful PowerPoint presentation which explains the history of the BBC's computer literacy project in the 1980s and why we did it and so on and so forth. And I was going to use this thing here, which we'll see in a minute, um, just to illustrate it, to play bits of uh, bit, uh, clips of video. But the uh, USB stick that I had my PowerPoint on, uh, it's just failed. And uh, thank you very much to all the people who were going to help me do a two-screen presentation, but it's now not necessary. One thing that has happened is that Patrick Titley, who's an old colleague of mine, and he, uh, he did a lot of uh, directing of the, of the programs, many of which I hope you remember, uh, has actually sort of stepped in and he's going to operate this machine. Uh, and so I hope we're going to um, end up by watching some rather more entertaining things than the things I might have been saying. I'm going to start with uh, just a, a mention, though. Alex Kratowski, I don't know if you've been listening to her Radio 4 um, series this week. I think it's called Alex in Wonderland. And it's a sort of chronicling of the internet um, from the early days, um, uh, from packet switching on onwards. Uh, and she's really looking at what she now calls a new dystopia, uh, malware and so on. And she mentions such things as spyware, viruses, worms, Trojan horses, phishing, um, identity theft, um, and so on. Uh, you know, cyber bullying and all those things. She sees a new dystopia, and she's calling out for uh, a new kind of, um, I suppose, school course, which would be called digital hygiene. <laughs> now, this morning, child children, we're going to do digital hygiene. You know, how to avoid being hacked, how to avoid being trolled, and so on and so forth. Um, but she began her um, series this week with, um, I woke up, <laughs> heard this little bit of one of our programmes. It's one that Patrick directed and I produced. And it's right in the middle of the BBC Computer Literacy uh, Project. And we'll just play this for a bit of nostalgia off a thing which is really quite important, which we're working on now. This is a beta test version of the what's called the CLAP database, Computer Literacy Archive Project. So we've put all the programs, that's not its official title, it's unofficial. <laughs> um, all the programs are on there. There are 2,000 video clips uh, from 150 programs. Each uh, clip is described. You've got the Radio Times billings for the programs. You've got uh, items down the side which are playing and you can play the programs in the windows, and it's taken a huge amount of effort, and it's all been done by ex-members of the production team, and we're about to show it to uh, Tony Hall because it's been done under the radar. So you're the first people to see this. This is a world launch. Can we launch that program? Ah, well. Yeah, well, it should, it should run on. Good morning. This is Studio 4 at the Kennedy Center. It's 11 o'clock, and this is Making a Muslim Micro Live. Oh, all right. Well, that's very, a very good start. Let's go to... Um, yeah. It will run on, but I can't remember how you, how you make it run on. Just click the play button, I suppose. Now, this was a program that went out on a Sunday morning. We took over the whole of Sunday morning on BBC One, because in those days, BBC Education could do that. Just keep pressing play, I think it should, it should just go on. You may wonder why we're doing this program live. Well, there are two reasons. Firstly, the previous speaker was getting in touch and get everything to do with... Turn it up. If anything could go wrong, would go wrong, and usually it did. And even the slightest slip led to some form of chaos. Anyone who's used a micro knows really that this is true. So today, we're showing reality, warts and all. Secondly, over 300,000 people wrote letters to the project asking for advice. And today, there's a unique chance for coders, tech freaks, 
and even ordinary nice people to put questions to our specialists in software, hardware and telecommunications right here in the studio. If you have a question, ring 01 811 8055. Yeah, right. <laughs> John Collins with us again. Today. Let's stop it there and go to the next time. No, he, said, he mentions it's a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, Paddy and I only really did it because it was a lot of fun. Uh, but I do have this waking dream of um, uh, coming up to the live transmission of a microlife program and not having rehearsed it. And I feel a bit like that now. <laughs> so uh, put up uh, uh, with me with, uh, with some uh, care, please. Now, the thing that Alex Grotowski's program... Um, uh, played was a little bit of the very famous hacking sequence. And I'm going to show you that because you may have heard it, uh, it uh, it's been on the radio several times lately, um, but you've probably never actually seen what actually happened. And it's quite interesting when you analyse it. John Cole tries to, it was demonstrating telecom gold and electronic mail, which of course was a new thing in those days. Um, and uh, he uses the telephone to dial an ordinary local number and can't get through and then he resorts to a packet-switched uh, system. And then, of course, you get the famous hackers inc incident. Let's see if it works. What's the code, John? <laughs> well, now, to connect the telephone line to the computer, you have to use one of two things, either an acoustic coupler or a modem. This is quite a nice acoustic coupler. Now, you just take the telephone Let me do this. Can you go to the home page? In that way, you get a very it's simple the little top owl, the top the left. And, okay. the micro. Okay. The nice and then with a I want you to go into this, this. Well, I'll talk you through it. This is battery driven. And uh, I was using one of these in, uh, in New York when I was over there with the BBC. So I could go to a local phone, put, uh, put in 10 cents, dial a local number, get me through through a satellite into the UK, into British Telecom Gold. And I'd already typed into the micro some messages I wanted to send. I'd shoot them through. And at any time of the day or night, I could do it. And then, of course, I could read the replies so they came through. It's a nice little system. Yeah, it's, it's very useful. Right, let's try going in now, uh, dialing the telephone, using this modem here and getting straight in. So we dial 9 for an outside line <coughs> and then 8372844 and we'll see if that will ring out. I have a nasty feeling, Mike, that we're going to have a few problems this morning. Um, partially because I think we're going to have more lot of lines busy. I don't know whether we'll get through on this number. It's ringing. We'll see. Uh, and it's still ringing. And if a hundred other people are also trying to ring in, we may not get in on this line. <laughs> but if not, we'll go around a different way. Right, I'm not going to get in that way, so I'm going to have to go in, I'm afraid, through a uh, packet switch system. Uh, sorry about that. 9075361631. Now, would you explain what a packet switch system is? And what <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, it's just another route going through another network. And unfortunately, it's a little more difficult to go in this way, and we hope we'll be able to get in the direct way. But it's another route through a national network into this London computer. I just hope fewer people are going that way. Right, that's whistling. And let's now wake up the uh, packet switch exchange, please. And come on, reply to me. Ah, I forgot to that. Right, and now it wants to know who I am. So this is the uh, code to get in here. TL, type that wrong. Gold. Yeah. And it didn't take because I made this typing mistake. And I do hope the cameras aren't on the keyboard. <laughs> right, and it now wants to know the address of the computer we want to get to. Well, I'll try and get to the one we were getting to. 219201004. That was a secret little piece of code you put in there. Right. Uh, <laughs> now, now, we are now at last through to this London computer, and that was where I was trying to get to by direct dialing. Right, British Telecom Gold, we're through. We now have to type in our identification, which we said our ID was OWL001. And the machine asks what our password is, so no cameras on the keyboard, please. The password is that. And Telecom Gold, automated office services, we're through. Mail call. <laughs> Computer security error. I think we have some hackers. 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 
put oh. something else where the vomit <laughs> out and try again. Try to get past logging in. We're hacking, hacking, hacking. That's <laughs> brilliant. So oh, right. it's first wife's maiden name. This is more than just a game. It's real fun, but just the same. It's hacking, hacking, hacking. Yes. Yeah, well, oh, no, no. ACL019, how about Alex from Oz and Young? How about Oz and Young? Just go away, will you? We want to do a demonstration here. Go away. <laughs> Right, now, if they've left this system anything like okay, that, that'll do, yeah. we should be able to do a metal scan. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, let me just explain. Uh, that program was done after the computer literacy project had been running for uh, two years, and we'd done two uh, major series, well, three major series uh, by then. Um, we'd had uh, over 300 letters into the, we had a helpline and a letters service for, uh, for support um, run by BBC, I forget what it was called, BBC, what was it called? Um, there was a thing that, that answered letters and... Support services. No, it wasn't, no. Anyway, um, we'd, we'd had a, we'd sold, the BBC computer had been on sale. Um, uh, two million BBC micros were sold. We were about to have the BBC uh, to, about to have the computers in school project supported by by, by the government, uh, where 85% of of uh, primary schools uh, chose BBC micros. They had a choice of of micros, um, and 65% of secondary schools um, chose to use micros. These were given to schools. Uh, used to, uh, uh, sorry, 65% chose the BBC micro, um, and. Uh, this was an enormously important initiative by the government to support what we were, what we were doing. And we learned later it was entirely because Kenneth Baker had persuaded Margaret Thatcher that he, she wanted some quick wins, and this was a quick win for her. Um, we would had a, a course that was associated with writing programs for the computer. It was called 100 Hour Basic. And this was uh, run in conjunction with the, the project by the National Extension College. And 300,000 people uh, took that course. Uh, it was uh, distributed uh, through centres all around the, the country. And those centres were modified by BBC education officers uh, who had a very important role in this, uh, in this whole event. They've now been disbanded, of course. And the... Uh, the number of people who were becoming interested in computing was absolutely rocketing upwards. We were getting two or three million uh, people watching each program, and the program was out two or three times a week. Um, and the reach, I forget what the reach was, but the reach for the, um, uh, for the, uh, the audience was, was really quite enormous. The interesting thing was that as we did the programs, the first series was more general and it actually didn't coincide with, at the very beginning, with the existence of the BBC Micro, which was late being delivered. It appeared uh, eventually, um, although I think there were people under the table uh, making it work, in quotes. Um, but the, um, the computer was uh, seen as an essential part of the, of the project. And the second series that we did, which was much more about how you actually do coding, uh, was more demanding, but actually got a bigger audience. And so there was a, there was a huge increase at that, that time. And the crucial thing about the whole project is it's timing. And I want to go back in time now to explain how the project uh, began and, and why it began. Now, can you find, this is where you have to go back. You can see the outline of the thing. You can choose to search by series, uh, by themes, through a timeline. Uh, which uh, shows you what was going on in the, the BBC project, along with what was happening with the wider computer world. Um, there's the history of the project there, which we'll have a look at in a minute. And also, crucially, with this, you can run BBC software through an emulator. You can run the BBC software that we use in the television programmes to illustrate principles. And we'll try and see if that can work later. We've got a problem here because the search box in that corner when you search by that, um, comes up with an error. At least I think it does. Could you go to series and go right down to the bottom? These are the series we did. You see, in, from, 1980, from 1997, sorry, uh, 19, sorry, 1978 right through to 1987, 
um, we did a whole series of, of series. And can you go down to related programs? And then at the top, you'll see the horizon. Now the chips are down. Now that horizon program was very important. Uh, if we can get it to, uh, to the point on the timeline. Just from the beginning? No, from, remember what we said was, oh, uh, yeah, okay. only so many minutes in. Uh, uh, right. This was back in 1978. And Horizon did a program. Uh, well, we're hoping to find the, the appropriate bit of it. Sorry, we haven't had time to rehearse this. But it's about 50, 50 was it? Yes, OK. This was a program that looked at the world of, micro, of the microprocessor and the fact that British industry was not doing anything to make use of microprocessors. It was really not, uh, it, not uh, taking um, very much, uh, paying very much attention to the new technology generally. The microelectronics revolution is, of course, it was being called in those days, whereas other countries were, run, were kind of running away with it. And it ended with this uh, comment about the government and the fact that the government was doing nothing at all uh, to promote the microelectronics revolution. I don't know if we can come in. Let's come in about there. Eight million pounds market just for trader. Some people believe that we must change from hardware to software, that we should stake our future on the chips not by making them, but by programming them, and that we should use our software skills to develop high technology industries around them. We are in a time of great innovation opportunity, and this is the great strength of the British. I mean, time and time again, we have led the world, the world in innovation and invention, and I think we've absolutely got this opportunity at the moment. I think we ought to regard the microprocessor and everything that goes with it as not an industry in itself, as far as we're concerned, but the raw material for an industry. We can buy it. <coughs> but it's, it's virtually nothing. Effectively, it's nothing. Shall we say five, five dollars? The actual product at the end of the day that might be a word processing device, an automatic uh, typing system, some automatic learning or teaching machine, some trading system for a banker, can be, shall we say, five thousand pounds or five thousand dollars. You can be, you're looking at a thousand to one multiplier in terms of the difference between the processor cost and finally what you can sell it. We're going to find all sorts of new ideas sprouting forth. Uh, and we do want to be able to tap them all, to be able to give somebody with a good, if you like, lateral thinking idea of applying a microprocessor in an entirely new sort of way. Give him the opportunity of really building on that, exploiting it, producing a world-beating product from it, marketing that product and reaping the rewards from it. The example of industry creation that everyone quotes is the EMI body scanner. An x-ray camera rotates around the patient's body, taking various pictures from different angles. All the pictures are fed into a computer, which combines them into a single view, as if you could see a section cut cleanly across the body, a view in which you can see the backbone, the muscles, and everything. What do the EMI have that the others don't have? They have software in the widest sense they have a piece of applied mathematics that enables them to process the information do this on computers and to create the image that is what they have the heart of it is software and that immediately in a short time <coughs> leads to an industry of creation an idea that didn't exist five years ago has now sold 200 million pounds worth of equipment is our future, then, the creation of more industries like this? One can hope so, but so far there are no other examples to point to. What will happen, then, to the men in today's jobs? Sorry. Can we all live on the wealth of automatic factories and the earnings of an elite band of 60,000 software engineers? It's time to think about the future. Questions are these. In the long term, when the only plentiful resource is going to be people, is automation the wrong road to take? Could this technology be the end of an age, the end of a line of evolution, and not a beginning? But in the short term, can we afford not to automate? If we don't, 
would our industry be disadvantaged by the automated industries abroad? And if we do automate, will we be able to cope with the problems of large-scale unemployment? Perhaps the survival of the nation depends upon its people finding meaningful lives. The questions shout. What is shocking is that the government has been totally unaware of the effects that this technology is going to create. The silence is terrifying. It's time we talked about the future. OK, stop it there. And that's exactly what we're going to try and... OK, and there was a discussion afterwards. Now... The important thing about that programme is that uh, it shook people up and it was distributed to all members of the Cabinet. Uh, and the BBC began to think it should be doing something to sort of take uh, note of this, what was happening. And we were approached in BBC Education, we were approached by the Manpower Services Commission, which was a quango uh, whose job was to look at uh, you know, employment futures and so on. And they said, the government really doesn't know what it's doing. Could you do some research for us, which would be independent research, which we could use? And we, we, uh, a few of us went to a very large number of countries. I won't list them, but we went to America and Sweden and Holland and France and so on, looking at what was going on, look at what was in industry was doing, at what uh, educationists were saying, at what unionists were saying about the job prospects. And the Germans were calling the chip the job killer, remember? OK, so it was considered very important that something should be done. And we were given the chance within the BBC to see what the BBC should be doing to meet the challenge of this. And we started looking around. Now, there were uh, home computers, a few of them, very expensive ones, the TRS-80 and so on and so forth. You could buy kits of computer parts if you went down the Edgware Road and you could solder them together and, and, and make something that probably wouldn't work. And there was very little around, uh, but there were a number of companies beginning to produce machines. Um, they were all speak, they were all basically programming uh, in basic. Let's, let's, let's face that. And so computer literacy was beginning to become equated with writing programs in basic. And George Osborne, just a few years ago, said that he learned all that he knew about computing, which is probably not very much, um, through using a BBC microcomputer to learn to, learn to write programs in basic. And the, the, the great philosophical idea was that this, this computer is coming along, it's going to dominate our lives in all kinds of ways, we must be able to dominate it. So in other words, it must necessarily not be a black box, it must be something that we learn to control ourselves. And so the hands-on philosophy became very important. So we had an approach to this, which was, let's write, let's make some television programs which show people how to use the computer for a whole range of things. And then we started looking at what computers there were, and they all spoke different dialects of BASIC. There were none of them very good structured um, BASICs. We had uh, the advice of some people, some experts on what a st good structured BASIC would be. We produced a thing called Adopted BASIC for Computers, which was a structured BASIC which we thought we could build into a television series of some kind. In those days, you could do didactic television series, remember. We had a meeting in uh, London with all the, producer, all the com uh, computer companies that we could find, and we said, could you adopt this on your machines? And they said, well, only if the government pay for the ROMs that you plug in. And the government basically said, no, we're not doing that. And the computer companies went away saying, on your bike. So we were left with, with, with the problem, what on earth do we do? And um, in the end, it takes a very long time to explain why it was. It, it just ho so happens at this moment in history when there wasn't the right sort of machine, we decided we needed a machine of our own. We tried to go with a company that was publicly funded through the National Research and Development Council called Newbury, the New Brain. I don't know if anyone's heard of the New Brain. Um, it failed. And then in desperation, we produced a specification which we sent out to all the British computer companies. We didn't have to compete outside. We weren't in Europe at that stage. Um, and the, um, uh, the a number of companies uh, said what they had in the pipeline. We looked at those uh, companies. We looked at what they had. Uh, and as you know, the, 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 uh, the, the story is that Acorn won the, won the contract. 
and we then started producing programs built around uh, the computer, which we had control of, and it was specially designed to uh, interact with the, um, the... You saw the computer screen there, it was a very clear image, because it, it, it was built along with uh, a lot of advice from BBC R&D, BBC Engineering, took a huge interest in the design of the machine. Uh, they also had a teletext decoder, which could uh, uh, take uh, telesoftware, uh, distributed through the CFAX lines, um, and uh, so you could download software overnight and run it in the machines and so forth. So it was a very integrated uh, system, and it, um, it was extremely successful. The project was very successful, although lots of people um, didn't approve of it, of course. Uh, now, I'd like you to see if you can find, if you go to um, Computers in Control program, or, or just uh, Computers in Control, yeah, program three, it's called Making Things Move. Yeah. And somewhere around there, you'll find one of those shows uh, 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 John Cole with um, John doing... John shows Binky. No, it's not Binky. <laughs> Binky was a robot. It's where he's, it shows... Um, let me just see. It's, it, it's just after that, I think. Go down a bit further. Eek. What does John do? Well, he's showing... Oh, well, let's show the, show the Ferris wheel. Okay. There we are. The thing is, our search thing doesn't work. If you type in a search thing, it just comes up with a, a load of error messages at the moment, uh, which is right. unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, suppose we want to use a DC motor, a power motor. How do we know where the position of that is? Yes, well, you have to somehow or other sense where the motor has got to. Now, in a uh, Ferris wheel, like this, in a fairground... It's built under the other one, Steve, once again. Oh, yes, he's been at it again. Um, this time, we have a DC motor here, <laughs> which drives the whole thing. But if you want to know where the wheel is, then you have to feed information back. And we've got a number of marking uh, points on here. On each strut, we put a reflective strip and a sensor here. So that sensor, connected to the computer, can tell the computer when one of these struts is going past the sensor. So you'd know when a cage is going past, but you wouldn't know necessarily which one. No, you've got to have another set of sensors to mark in some way uh, cage number one. And in fact, this is cage number one, or cart number one. And here we've got another reflective strip, and another sensor down here, which is able to determine when that particular cage goes past, so that we know we're at cage one, after which the other sensor can keep count of those uh, things. Now, at the moment, the computer doesn't know where it is. If you rotate that slowly, it'll suddenly sense when it gets to cage one, there it goes, and from then on, it can keep control or keep count of the carts as they go past. Now, if I turn the power on, we can make the computer drive that, and, of course, we could use the computer to stop the DC motor when a particular cage got to the bottom. So, um, if I can find the right button to push, there we are, It'll offer me uh, the ability to stop at a particular cage. Now, which one would you like? Maybe let's say four. Stop at cage number four, right? Uh, so if I push it now, it's waiting for number four to come up. Has it managed? And there it is. It's going to be jump, but it's pull it back. Yes, it's a big okay. jump. I think you'll manage. All right. Of course, the problem Let me stop with it there. You've only yeah. got six positions. I think you can see that um, you could do something fairly didactic in those days. And earlier on in the program, I'm sorry, we can't show you the clips that I planned because when we try searching for them through the, the, the top, we get this huge error message. So you just have to get a, a feel for this. This is a piece of software we hope to make available more generally. Uh, at the moment, it's, uh, it's sort of sub judice within the BBC because um, there are all sorts of copyright issues theoretically about um, things like, I know you can find virtually all these programs probably on the internet, but nonetheless, if the BBC starts um, producing them in a form like this, that's a bit like the iPlayer and so on, um, all sorts of questions can be asked. So we've got to sort of go through all the hoops of trying to get it approved and so on and so forth and costing it and see what it would cost to, to, do, to, to do it. But you can see that this, is a, this chronicles the whole of a, um, a decade of uh, computer development. And if you go to a thing like the National Museum of Computing and you see a, a, you know, a, a computer of that period in, 
in a glass case. It doesn't mean very much, but when you see it actually on the day it was, it was on, the, on, 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 on the streets, it brings the whole thing alive. And I think uh, you may find uh, this very, very, very interesting and very useful. I'm sorry this has been a bit sort of uh, random, but I think it shows basically what we did. It was very important, the, uh, the, the business of telesoftware was, uh, was very important for the BBC because um, uh, it developed into a data service. Eventually, people like bookmakers were getting live information uh, sent through the CFAX uh, information, downloaded through the, the decoders, and then they could see the results of races sort of straight away and things like that. It got, uh, it got rather um, lost its original purpose, which was for downloading educational software. But what it did for the BBC was it gave them a start in the whole business of talking to set-top boxes. And so they had various patents that put them into a very strong position when it came to all that, you know, all that we're used to today when it comes to controlling, um, controlling uh, your computer you know, using, a, using a handset and so on. So it was very important for them, and BBC Engineering, I hope, uh, uh, you know, get a proper mention in the, in the thing here. Can we just look at the history section? Have I run out of time? Do you must keep on? I have no idea where we are. So if you go to the introduction there, this is a very important photograph. These are DTI ministers, Department of Trade and Industry ministers, sitting in front of the BBC Micro in a row. There's... Uh, um, there's Norman Lamont. There's Kenneth Baker, and they're all sitting in front of the uh, of the uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, BBC machine and this is at the launch, uh, learning about computer literacy, and they're running the welcome tape that was uh, that came with the machine, and uh, Patrick Jenkin there. This one here. There was one program that was typing a whole series of words, and it'll you know press return. It puts them into alphabetical order. And he was sitting there typing, Patrick Aloysius Sinjin Jenkins, Secretary of State for Industry, press return, you know, it would alphabetize them. And Kenneth Baker, was, if you go there, is there another picture of Kenneth Baker lower down? Saying, oh, it's a bit like a typewriter, isn't it? And so on. Um, and uh, there you see the Acorn team with us uh, at the launch. So the history is all, on, all in there as well. And... Um, there's the, it's a bit like a typewriter. Sorry? <laughs> yes. Go a bit further. You can see some of the, uh, the stuff we did. There was the computer book, which was a bestseller for three months. There was the, um, the user guide for the c computer itself. There was a whole lot of software that was generated at a time when there was almost no application software at all. The welcome tape was virtually the first um, uh, applications program which used things like pages, you know, cycling pages, different sizes of type, colour and sound. It was very novel. Um, and the whole thing was written up and there's a big thing there, the uh, computer literacy project uh, written up by John Radcliffe who was the executive producer who had to deal with all the politics, such as people saying we shouldn't have done it. Um, but looking back on it now, it's a very interesting part of BBC history. Um, there has been nothing really like it until recently when the micro bit um, was produced and there's been a digital initiative in the BBC which has now stopped because <coughs> the BBC gets bored with things after a while. But uh, if you haven't seen the, the micro bit, this is now going to be distributed. Two million of these are going to be distributed to uh, school children and uh, if you press a button somewhere, you can program it uh, using a USB connector. And uh, I don't know why this doesn't work. It worked earlier. Oh, there it is. So it says hello or something like that. And it's got uh, motion detectors and uh, so on. But this is being given to t uh, for 2 million children. And uh, with any luck. Um, you know, we'll create a new generation of, of coders um, using this possibly as a starting point. And my grandson is getting one for his birthday in a week's time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, they're, well, they're, they're free. They're, well, you can buy them, but uh, yes. <laughs> oh, I see, I see, absolutely. Cheapskate. 
Any questions? Um, and I'm sorry it's been so rambling. Thank you for your time. Well,